Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to this webinar on history, memory, and myths of Enrica de Malaca or Maluku in Southeast Asia, an event jointly organized by the De La Salle University, Southeast Asia Research Center and Hub, and the Department of History. And our speakers this afternoon are Dr. Rommel A. Kuraming of the University of Brunei, Jerusalem, and myself. I am Dr. Fernando A. Santiago, Jr., the director of the Southeast Asia Research Center and Hub. Now, allow me to read the abstract before we hear the, the lecture of Dr. Kuraming. Um, Enrique de Malaca, or Maluku, is an enigmatic historical figure in maritime Southeast Asia. Identified as the Malay interpreter in Ferdinand Magellan's Armada de Maluku on the 16th century quest to reach the Spice Islands by sailing west, he is remembered today as Magellan's slave, an explorer, a hero, and even a legend. Some scholars have posited the possibility that he was the first person to circumnavigate the world, a great feat of mankind. But for his mere participation in the greatest sea voyage in the age of discovery, um, well, that has been sufficient for him to merit special recognition in the region. Such is his renown that some Filipinos and Malaysians consider him as a source of national pride. And there are even competing claims on his place of origin among the countries of the region, including the Philippines. Now, through a scholarly lens, this webinar shall assess Enrique de Malaca or Enrique de Maluku in history, his memory and myths. It will look into the questions concerning his origins and circumstances and present the man in the historical records and evaluate the popular views about him. Now, our first speaker is a senior assistant professor at the History and International Studies Program of the University of Brunei, Jerusalem. Before joining UBD, he was a postdoctoral fellow at the La Trobe University and the National University of Singapore. His research focuses on various aspects and cases of knowledge production and consumption in and on Southeast Asia, particularly Indonesia and the Philippines. Now, he published in um, international journals, such as the Critical Asian Studies, Southeast Asia, um, Power um, Research, Time and Society, Inter-Asia Cultural Studies, Philippine Studies, among others. And his book, Power and Knowledge in Southeast Asia, State and Scholars in Indonesia and the Philippines, was published in 2020 by Routledge. So without much further ado, ladies and gentlemen, I have the pleasure to introduce my friend, Dr. Rommel A. Kurami. Dr. Kurami. I cannot, I cannot start my video because it says the host stopped it. Let, Can you allow me, me to? Yes, let me fix that. Yeah. Okay. Can you try again, please? Oh, yeah, this one. Okay. Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for joining us in this afternoon's webinar. I'd like to thank um, Bernie the director of the search and the Rasal University for this opportunity to share some thoughts about uh, Enrique de Malaca. It's, um... oh wait, I need to share my PowerPoint, my screen. Bernie, can you allow me to share this? It's, it's, uh, it's activated now. Okay, so <clears throat> let me start with the broadest background very quickly. So we're talking about Enrique de Malaca in, um, in line with the <clears throat> 500 year anniversary of Magellan's voyage, the yeah, circumnavigation of the world. So since 2019, we have a lot 
we have had a lot of commemorative activities. To remember this uh, historic episode. And um, this is also the occasion that uh, allowed Enrique de Malaca to be talked about once again. And uh, as uh, Fernie has mentioned earlier, his claim rests on the possibility that he may be the first circ circumnavigator of the world. Okay, so very quickly, Enrique de Malaca is known um, with various names. Enrique de Malaca, Ang Lima Awang in Malaysia. And more recently, I'm going to talk about in a while, Enrique, Enrique Maluku. So from the Indonesian side, he's known as Enrique Maluku. Enrique Maluku. So yeah, so he's a Magellan slave and he was captured possibly in 1511. There's a possibility that not in 1511. So let's, uh, 1511, let's put it as a possibility. So he accompanied Magellan in his voyages in going back to Europe and going, going to the North Africa, Morocco, and eventually the, he joined the historic voyage start, that started in 1598. So he served as interpreter in this famous voyage. And as I mentioned, he, his fame rests on the possibility that he may be the first circumnavigator of the world. Okay, one thing about uh, Enrique is the extremely limited historical sources. First point I'd like to make here is the extremely limited historical sources. Picapeta's account, re regarded as the most authoritative, comprehensive that we can that we have, an eyewitness account. Um, in this particular account, we can see Enrique being uh, mentioned only once. He was uh, referred to as slave eight times and as interpreter 15 times. In over a thousand days covered by the account, he figured only within 35 days. And of those 35 days, only eight days, Enrique was actually, um, you can hear about Enrique. So it is how limited sources um, about him are. And one reason why there, there are a lot of controversies about his origin is precisely because of these limited uh, sources. Um, actually, <clears throat> Oh, we can summarize in one sentence. In one sentence, what we can, what, what the Gapeta said about Enrique. So it is that limited. We, we can add a few more to the Gapeta's account. So I'm not going to go through the details this. I just like to mention the ones that are specifically germane to my uh, focus on Malaysia and Indonesia. The first, um, one is uh, Magellan's Last Will and Testament. And in this uh, Last Will and Testament, uh, he was, uh... oh wait, sorry about that. Um... <clears throat> in this Last Will and Testament, um, he was, um, indicated to be a cap captured slave, that he was uh, the native of Malacca, and that he was a mulatto. So all these things are key points um, in, the, in the ongoing contestation for, for Enrique, who, who really owns Enrique. And um, this, this document is the primary basis for Malaysia's claim that Enrique is from Malacca. So another is Ines de Mapra's recollection. It's, I'm not going to say more about this, except that, yeah, there was only one passage there about Enrique being drunk that we, we can uh, note of. 
Another is Maximilianus Transylvanus Molusis Insules. So this is a crucial, this is a very important source, particularly for the claim coming from Indonesia. In this, in this, uh, this is a letter, a long letter, and uh, this was written as an offshoot of uh, interviews with some of the survivors of those who were able to return to Spain in, uh, 15, in September of 1522. So um, Maximilianus managed to interview them and he wrote this kind of account. It's important because it's specifically stated that Enrique was from Maluku. So it specifically stated that he was from Maluku, not from Malacca. And another thing is, um, yeah, another point I'd like to mention about Maximilian Sanzibar's account is it came earlier than, um, it circulated in Europe earlier than Pigapeta's account. And it was much more widely circulated. Pigapeta's um, French version would come out 1525, 1526, and the full version would, would not come out until 1800s. So in terms of the impact, of the under, in, in terms of the understanding of the voyage that circulated wide, more widely in, in Europe, Maximiliano Transalvanus account um, may have that uh, more than Pegapetas during the time. So another important uh, document was uh, Martin Fernandez de Barretes, Collection de los Viajes. So here as well, Enrique was from Maluku. And also we can find here that Enrique was listed among those who died in the massacre of uh, May 1, 1521. So those, on top of that is Gomaras and um, has to do with the presentation of Enrique before the advisor to the Spanish king. So for, my, for the purpose of my presentation today, this, the, the three, the one by uh, Magellan's um, Last Will and Testament, Maximilianus and Solvinianus' uh, letter, and Martin Fernandez de Barete. These are the, the key, key bases for uh, the claims of Malaysia and Indonesia. Now, I mentioned earlier that we can, we can um, summarize in one sentence what Pigapeta said about Enrique. If we add these additional accounts, we can still summarize it in one sentence. And this would look something like this. Okay, so this is one sentence, long sentence summary of what we can say about if, uh, Enrique if we add those additional uh, information. Despite this, despite these very limited um, sources, fully developed life stories about him spanning from 1490s to 1560s were written. And these were complete with fiancé, son, itinerary of travel, how impressive his skills were, his loyalty to Islam or to animism. Talks about graveyard, compass that he was supposed to have uh, developed. So all of those kind of details, very fascinating details. 500 years later, Enrique lives, he still lives a heroic, accomplished and colorful life in Malaysia, the Philippines and since recently also in Indonesia. Okay, so there are some key concepts that um, will help us understand this, um, um, <clears throat> how Enrique's uh, may be understood up to today. Of course, we know history. It's, um, as we know, the past as reconstructed by historians based on available evidences. And we also have myths. The past that is founded on false belief. This is the opposite of history. 
So history and myths, they are usually framed as uh, opposite to one another. The third one is quite interesting, myth history. Myth history, synthesizing history and myths. So you probably wonder, how can we synthesize what is supposedly factual and what is supposedly just, uh, yeah, it's opposite, falsehood. Um, I got this um, terminology from a uh, famous, um, <clears throat> a well-known historian, William McNeil. In 1985, he, he del delivered, he was the president of uh, the American Historical Association. And um, it's a tradition, the president delivers this kind of presidential address. And he shocked many in the audience when he said, for example, and I quote, myth and history are close kin in as much as both explain how things got to be the way they are by telling some sort of story. So rather than oppositional in relationship, McNeil considered history and myths as functionally analogous. And he also said, what seems true to one historian will seem false to another. So one historian's truth becomes another's myth. So we see this kind of uh, synthesizing history and um, Myth. Um, will um, I, I, I try to explain in a while? Would be very useful in so far as Enrique's concerned, because um, the understanding of Enrique, particularly for example in in Malaysia, is actually a combination of history and myths. So the novel that was written about him, which I'm going to discuss in a while, is is really that kind of combination. Now, the terminology, myth history, didn't really take off. It was not really well uh, used. Um, and rather than that, the, the notion of memory is the past as remembered, whether it is true or not, by groups or individuals, depending on their needs at a particular time. So the notion of memory is a much more widely accepted within the scholarly community, not just within history, but in many other social sciences. And um, this is very helpful. If we don't like to use terminology myth history, memory might be more acceptable. But in reality, myth history and memory are just, uh, yeah, quite similar, considering that they don't really pay much attention to accuracy. What is important for both of this is the use, the value, the meaning for the consumer of uh, whatever it is, consumer of knowledge. Okay, so let me uh, discuss about the case of Malaysia. Um, the, it, it's quite early in Malaysia, 1955. Okay, so, oh, I mean, uh, there, there, there was this uh, novel that was published in 1958 called Panglima Awa. And uh, the Harun Hamina Rashid, who was the, who was the author a famous Malay writer wrote this novel, and um, and he was inspired by by an article that appeared in Straits Times sometime in 1955. The idea that the first man to sail around the world was a Malay. So that's the idea that he got, and he he yeah. Based on it appears that uh, Amin Rusi did not really read any other um, sources. It appears he didn't really um, read. There's no, I, I cannot find the, some, uh, some kind of evidence that he read uh, Pigapeta's account. Um, and and um, it became a very famous book. It came out soon after the independence of uh, Malaysia in 1957. And that's the reason why some scholars would call it um, independence novel. So it was widely read. By 1973, for example, it has been reprinted 13 times. And it became one of the required readings in literature classes and was also examinable, um, part of the examinations um, in Malaysia. So this is a very imaginative biographical novel. It's um, 
it's a very fascinating look at um, how Malaysian intellectual, a Malay intellectual during the time. Actually, I mean, Hamid Rashid was based in um, yeah Singapore during the time. So how, he, it's fascinating to look how a Malay of that period um, think about nationalism, loyalty to the Sultan, um, about that kind of uh, colonial relations and uh, the feudal relations as well. So it's very, yeah, it's an interesting uh, novel. He gave, he, um, he developed character of Panglima Awang, by the way, he, um, because the name of Enrique was not known. Uh, in the, he, he gave him a very common name, Panglima Awang. Awang is a very common name. Panglima means commander or chief. So it says, our captain. So that attribution of leadership. So he was, uh, yeah, he was depicted as an exemplary warrior, loyal, brave, patriotic, and um, uh, became close to Magellan and his family. He was captured. And yeah, the, the idea that he was captured in 1511, um, yeah, against the backdrop of the Portuguese uh, attack or capture of Malacca, that was the backdrop of the novel. It started as, as um, with, with the um, conquest attacked by the Portuguese. And he was captured and then Magellan brought him along and uh, he, he became close to Magellan's family, even becoming very, uh, almost becoming some kind of, uh, he was smitten by the Magellan's sister. So it's almost that kind of, there's a romantic angle to that. But uh, he was supposed to be loyal to his fiance that was left behind in in Panamalayu. So he didn't uh, he didn't uh, um, return Magellan's sister's love. So he joined the voyage, and um, as we know, uh, yeah. So when the voyage reached the Philippines in 1521, Magellan was killed. And a um, few days later, um, there was a massacre of Magellan's men. Some of them, more than 20 people, uh, more than 20 of Magellan's men were, were massacred. And that was on May 1st of 1521. So, um, so that's the, after that, the, the story, said that he he went back he returned to Tanamalayu okay to not really Malacca but Tanamalayu uh he, he returned and eventually uh, reunited with his fiance and they got married toward the end and um, the struggle against the Portuguese continued so a few years later there was a sequel to that novel and uh, yeah it's now about the son of Panglima Awang, published in 1961. Uh, so yeah, so it's um, along with the other novel, the impact of this novel, these two novels in the imagination of Malaysians was enormous. Much of what is understood by Malaysians about Enrique came from the two novels. So the it. There is spin up of various activities, both academic and non academic. Um, they took easily for granted the, historic the historicity of uh, what is uh, otherwise largely historical or mythical rendition of Panglima Awang. So in Malaysia, Panglima Awang, in Rekidi Malaka, Panglima Awang is, um, yeah. If, if, if you recall what I said earlier, that we can, we can say in one sentence, we can capture in one sentence, we can summarize in one sentence, what can be said uh, historically, based on historical record about Enrique um, de Malaca, we, we, we can easily infer without reading the novel that much of it is really not historical. Okay? So, but for, most, for many Malaysians, that's not the case. They, 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 this is some kind of history. And you would see this in the in the discussion online. We had fascinating look into discussions online, and in Malaysians would really insist that Panglima Awang was like this or like that. And if you trace the idea of where did they get those those points, these are from the 
novels. So academic, for example, there are some scholars who are looking for, um, they're trying to find, uh, uh, they're trying to find Pangli Maawang's, uh, yes, Pangli Maawang's uh, graveyard. And they, co they consider, they, they thought that the, the first compass in the world was developed by Pangli Maawang. So you would see this kind of thing. So even, it's not just the novelist, it's not just the literary person, but also some scholars would really find, uh, do serious studies with the presumption of the historicity of, yeah, their understanding that 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 uh, Panglimaawang actually returned to Tana, Tana Malayu. So that that came from the novel. Okay, so up to 2014, only Malaysia and the Philippines were involved in dispute over national ownership of Enrique. So my colleague, my friend, uh, Fernie would discuss about the Philippines. Um, so it would change 2014. It's a turning point in the case of Indonesia. So the in 2014, um, this book was published. It's called Enrique Maluku. And this is based on the claims, as I mentioned earlier, of Maximilianus Transmilianus, that he was from Maluku. They also made capitalize on the idea that that notion of Henry the Black. Henry the Black. Okay, you can see here, for example, in the second edition um, cover, you would see. This is the first edition cover you would see the how way the way how they depicted uh, in Enrique and the authors were very unhappy about this it's not this is not the cover that they like because this depiction is is like a pirate of the caribbean so they didn't like that actually this is what they need what they needed but they were rushing to publish it and the publisher published it in this with with this cover to the consternation of the authors so they capitalized on the idea that um, he was black, and he, and and they said Sumatrans, Filipinos, and Malays cannot be as dark as orang as as Maluku, people from Maluku, because they have that kind of Melanesian um, features like this. So that's the basis for their claim that he must have come from Maluku, not from Malacca, or not from the Philippines as well. Okay, so actually in Indonesia. I am. This is already quite a long. Okay, so I'm 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 coming to a close. So the in Indonesia, it the idea was first circulated very early, 15, 1956 as well. Um, 1956, it, it came in the newspaper, and um, um, but during the time, nobody really paid attention to this. This this happened only 2014 with this book. And the reception in Indonesia, yeah. So that's the, Indonesia was, was rather surprised by this kind of claim. So a lot of people didn't believe that uh, the person who first circumnavigated the world was uh, from Indonesia. As, yeah, but um, so, so up, uh, but more and more Indonesians are increasingly believing in this. And uh, before 2014, you can see here, nothing, no mention of Enrique Maluku. Enrique Maluku became um, yeah, searchable term only starting 2014 and from that point on. So you would see there and, um, and uh, since 2019, since 2019, you can see that tensions between Indonesian and Malay netizens have been uh, really uh, becoming intense. So, these tensions when Malaysians heard that the Indonesians were claiming that uh, Enrique was from Maluku, so they they were uh, those people those Malaysians were enraged by this claim, and this kind of very tense, uh, very um, yeah, that kind of ten tensions are actually rooted in the long-standing. Um, long-standing problem between the two countries. So there's been an ongoing heritage war between these two countries. That since early 2000, it, um, they were, yeah, this kind of conflict between ownership of batik or uh, a folk song or food. So they're, yeah, they are, Malaysia and Indonesia are fighting over it. Now, this Enrique Maluku, Malu, um, Malaka Maluku, this would, 
possibly become a next uh, chapter in this ongoing in this ongoing conflict between the, the two countries. So since 2019, there's this kind of uh, exchanges, very heated exchanges online, and uh, they're still rather small scale. And uh, in terms of regularity, they're not really, really not yet very regular. But you wait until more Indonesians get to know about Enrique Maluku, and there's likely to be going to be a lot of uh, uh, tensions online. So on that point, I'd like to end my presentation. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Romel, for that very uh, interesting presentation. Now, um, please allow me to introduce myself. So I am an associate professor of the history department of De La Salle University, Manila, uh, where I, uh, in the same university, I serve as the director of the Southeast Asia Research Center and Hub. And um, well, I've served as the assistant dean for research and advanced studies of the College of Liberal Arts. Um, I'm also a member of the uh, board of the Philippine Historic and the Social Science Research Ethics Board of the uh, Philippine Social Science Council. Now, uh, my research interests include rural history, Southeast Asian history, local history, oral history, and biographies. Now, um, I'm not going to share a PowerPoint presentation because my uh, connection is a bit weak. It was laggy okay, when, uh, Dr. when, when Rommel and I were um, trying out uh, the system. So um, please allow me to just read my presentation. So what, what I will do is um, I will present a genealogy of the idea of um, Enrica de Malaca in the Philippines. So um, we will take a look at Enrica de Malaca in the historical records and also at how Enrique has been perceived and um, throughout the 20th, mostly okay, throughout the 20th century. So Enrique de Malaca is an enigmatic figure in maritime Southeast Asia. As already mentioned earlier, and since very little is revealed about him by historical sources, over time, many stories have spread to the point that there are now two Enriques, okay? the Enrique de Malaca of history and the Enrique de Malaca of the imagination. This is particularly true in the Philippines, where some scholars have even claimed Enrique as a compatriot, a native Cebuano, thus opening the possibility that a Filipino, a Cebuano, was the first man to circumnavigate the world. Now, my task, okay, my task is to distinguish the historical Enrique from the mythological Enrique. And I shall first present the historical sources from which we get the details of his biography. Then I will briefly explain how he came to be regarded as a Filipino. Now, I will also share some um, fictitious portrayals of Enrique in popular culture, though cursory, okay, I'm not going to go into that too much, um, but the portrayals of Enrique in popular culture through cinema and literature. Okay, and then afterwards, um, Rommel and I, uh, we'll discuss the uh, signification of Enrique in present times, okay? And of course, uh, you're most welcome to uh, type in your questions in the chat box or the Q&A box at any point in time, and we will address it uh, later. Now, um, first I must emphasize that while Filipino historians recognize Enrique as Magellan's slave, who played an important role in the Armada de Maluco, when it arrived in the Philippines 500 years ago this year. Okay, so it's the quincentenary as mentioned by Rommel earlier. Um, so while many Filipinos recognize him, Filipino historians generally don't regard him as a fellow, a fellow Filipino, contrary to a recent claim. Okay, and for this reason, his name seldom appears in Philippine history textbooks where if he is mentioned, neither is he identified as a Filipino. Thus, while many are aware of the idea that he is a co-patriot, that he is a Filipino, 
it has not gained good traction for it to be regarded as historical truth. Okay, so it's out there, but it's not necessarily an accepted fact by Filipino historians as recently claimed. Okay, now let me discuss the historical documents. Enrique de Malaca's biography is intertwined with the life and times of Ferdinand Magellan. His life story, if um, his life story is in fact almost inextricable from that of the great explorers. While it is assumed that he was captured or purchased by Magellan in the year 1511, okay, so again, as Roma said earlier, there could have been earlier, it could have been a bit later, but um, the uh, sort of the accepted date when they came together or when they were brought together was 1511 uh, during the siege of Malacca. His name only appears in historical records starting in the year 1518. Okay, and this was when he, together with a uh, Sumatran female slave, okay, he and the, and the other uh, person were presented to a council in Spain to convince the king to support Magellan's proposed expedition to sail west, okay, to reach the Mulus. So that's 1580. And he was last sight cited in Cebu in the year 1521, as already mentioned earlier. So either as a uh, victim or a survivor of the fatal banquet hosted by Raja Humabon. Okay, so um, thus Enrique's life in the historical narrative covers only a span of four years. So it, the, the information as already mentioned is very sparse. Okay, 1511 is a mere assumption. Um, so more or less, okay, that's when they got together. But as far as the uh, extant historical records are concerned, uh, his first appearance was 1518, and his the last time he was cited uh, was 1521. Now, um, as already stated, there are hist few historical documents about him, and uh, they are mostly based on eye eyewitness accounts, such as Antonio Pigafetta's Primo Viaggio in Torno al Mondo. Okay, which is his personal narrative. He was part of Magellan's, the Magellan Elcano expedition. Okay, and the other one is the account of uh, Maximilianus Transilvanus, okay, the uh, Demolucci's Insulis, which is based on interviews conducted in 1522 with survivors of uh, the expedition. Okay, so there are other accounts such as Peter Martyr's De Orbe Novo, okay, and other survivor accounts, such as those of a, well, an anonymous Genoese pilot. Okay, and there's also uh, a, uh, well, another survivor uh, whose name was Hines de Mafra. But the latter okay, have much less information about Enrique than the earlier mentioned uh, eyewitness accounts. Aside from the eyewitness accounts, there are also other documentary evidences, or sorry, uh, documentary evidence or sources. Of great significance is Magellan's will, as already presented by Rommel, okay, his last will and testament, which was executed in 1519, shortly before he departed um, for his voyage. Uh, the Magellan's will provides the greatest amount of information about Enrique's personal circumstances. Um, now, other records that show his name are the ship's log. Okay, uh, he was part of Magellan's flagship, the now Trinidad, which identifies him as a Malay server, sorry, servant and interpreter. Lengua, okay, was the term used. Now, the proceedings during the investigation conducted in Spain upon the return of the survivors of the voyage uh, which by then was led by Sebastian Elcano, um, well, have also yielded information on Enrique's involvement during the expedition. Now, while the historical sources are few, with regard to Enrique, there are plenty of inconsistencies. So, you know, uh, as already uh, shared earlier, um, was he from Malacca? Was he from Sumatra? Was he from the Molucas? Okay, all of those places appear in the historical records. Now, um, well, there are other inconsistencies, such as uh, it was mentioned earlier that Enrique was accused of uh, being a traitor to his uh, 
uh, companions by um, basically conniving with the ruler of Cebu okay, uh, in the massacre that occurred on May 1, 1521. And uh, the inconsistency is uh, with regard who provoked Enrique. Okay, so in, in one account, it's um, Jago. Um, uh, well, he, uh, the, the, the brother-in-law of Magellan. Okay, and in the, in the other account, it's Juan Serrano. So there are inconsistencies in the records. Now, it is for such that there have been discrepancies okay, in his life story. And this is also the root of regarding Enrique. Now, let me give you a, a background of Enrique de Malaca based on the sources. And some of these have already been mentioned. Um, the best known is Antonio Pigafetta's Primo Viaggio in Torno al Mondo, where Enrique is simply identified as, a, as of Sumatran origin. Pigafetta was a young Italian who joined the Magellan Elcano expedition as a volunteer. And he took on the task of recording the events of the trip, thus producing the longest and the most valuable narrative of the voyage. And he was among the few who were fortunate to return to Spain in 22, okay, thus being one of the first to circumnavigate the world. The value of his narrative is that it is an eyewitness account, okay, the ideal primary source to historians. And aside from that, as far as Enrique is concerned, acquainted with Enrique, they knew each other personally. Now, the second source is the uh, Demolucci's Insulis by Maximilianus Transilvanus, who said that Enrique was not born in Sumatra, but was born in the Moluccas, and whom Magellan purchased in Malacca. So unlike Pigafetta, um, Maximilianus was not part of the voyage. Uh, but nonetheless, as stated earlier, he published the first account of the Magellan Elcano expedition using information gathered from interviews with the survivors of the expedition, including Sebastian Elcano, the commander of the ship. So this methodology today we call as uh, the oral history method. Okay, so it's uh, you know data gathering mainly through interviews. Now, the other important document is the last will and testament of Ferdinand Magellan, which was, um, um, well, Magellan was the master of Enrique, okay? And uh, as I said, uh, before he left uh, for the voyage, executed, uh, dated on August 24, 1519. So about a month prior to embarking on the voyage. Now, the portion of the will concerning Enrique states the following. Okay, let me just read it. Um, and by this, my present will and testament, I declare and ordain as free and quit of every obligation of captivity, subjection, and slavery, my captured slave Enrique, okay, mulatto, native of the city of, of the age of 26 years, more or less, thenceforward forever, the said Enrique may be free and manumitted and quit, exempt, and relieved of every obligation of slavery and subjugation, that he may act as he desires and thinks fit, and I desire that of my estate there may be given to the said Enrique the sum of 10,000 maravedis in money for his support. And this manumission I grant because he is a Christian, and that he may pray to God for my soul. Now, of these three um, historical so but it provides the great on the background of Enrique. Uh, the will also reveals the following key information regarding his identity, his status, his race, origin, age, and religion. So contrary to Transylvanus's account, it states that Enrique was captured and not purchased by Magellan. Um, it also describes Enrique as a mulatto. Okay, and mulatto is a racial category used in the Spanish Empire to refer to people of mixed race, usually with African ancestry. And this appears to be the basis of Enrique's other name, which is Enrique the Black, okay, or Black Henry. 
Now, um, in the English translation by Guillemard on the will. However, in the Spanish original, the word used was not mulato, but loro, okay, which is an archaic term. It's not used anymore. And loro, which means laurel, okay, laurel, was uh, regarded as an intermediate color. The term was commonly used to describe people of brown com complexion, okay, except that it applied particularly to individuals who were not of Islamic origin. So um, earlier it was mentioned um, that um, there's also a movement in Malaysia okay, to claim Enrique as their own. And um, it seems based on the discussions I've heard that there's also a, well, the, the, there seems to be desire okay, for Enrique to have been a Muslim prior to his conversion to Christianity. Okay, but then uh, the words in the will seem to, um, well, will seem to dispute that. Now, both Antonio Pigafetta and Maximilianus Transilvanus pointed to Indonesia as Enrique's place of origin. However, Magellan in his last will and testament described his slave, uh, he described his slave as a native of the city of Malacca, thus making him Malaysian. And this was a statement made on a legal, legal document. Okay, and we can, of course, uh, uh, recognize that uh, Magellan, aside from having executed a legal document and having sworn to its um, authenticity, um, well, basically, uh, he also knew Enrique uh, the longest for, we assume, okay, that they had been together as early as 1511, so much longer than um, Pigafetta would have known Enrique. Now, um, it's just unfortunate that while Pigafetta wrote the essential record on Enrique, he doesn't explain okay, why he said that Enrique was of, a, of Sumatran origin, nor does he state where he derived the information. Okay? Now, Transylvanus never met Enrique. Okay? So what he knew about him was all secondhand information and derived from people he interviewed. And he may have thus uh, concluded that Enrique originated in the Molucas because of ability to speak the language of the place. Okay. Now, um, among the three documents, Magellan's last will uh, can be regarded as the most reliable. Okay. But then, of course, um, as explained by Rommel earlier, uh, uh, the accounts of Pigafetta and uh, Transylvanus also have their purposes. Okay. Um, well, they address the needs of, um, well, our societies okay, today. Now, the final detail revealed, revealed by the will, as I said earlier, uh, is that he was a Christian. Now, there's no record if uh, he converted. Um, you know, we don't even know if he was even a Christian prior to uh, him meeting Magellan. Okay? Uh, what he was, we don't really know. So conversion is um, merely a speculation. But the probability that he is a convert is actually quite high, because as we know from our own experience in the Philippines, uh, Iberians had to, well, they had this tendency okay, to convert people to Christianity. Um, they were known to have carried the zeal okay, of converting others to their religion um, as part of the spirit of the Reconquista. Okay? And, and like, like Spain, Portugal was part of it. And um, you know, looking at the accounts, uh, particularly Magellan's behavior in the Philippines, it seems that Magellan was deeply okay, affected by the zeal of the Reconquista. So this would have uh, motivated him to convert Enrique to Christianity. And not only that, um, the Portuguese uh, you know, attacked the, the, the siege, uh, the capture of, the, of uh, Malacca began in the year, well, uh, on July 1 in the year 1511. And uh, St. Henry's Day okay, is July 13th, a few days okay, after the attack began. So some scholars have also um, you know, uh, arrived at the conclusion that Enrique may have been converted on that day. And uh, for that reason, uh, he adopted the saint's name, the, 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 the name of the saint who was celebrating his feast day, feast day that day. 
Now, based on the primary sources, historical uh, narratives involving Enrique were written by renowned scholars. Two, Zalo Fernandez de Oviedo, who wrote his uh, um, history in 1535, um, Francisco Lopez de, de Gomara in 1552, okay, and others. But one of the earliest, if not the earliest biography of Enrique was written in 1837 by Martin Fernandez de Navarrete. Okay, and Navarrete used the primary sources. He had access to the primary sources. And uh, he also used uh, Oviedo and Gomara as his sources. So basically, um, well, uh, the Rommel had already provided the um, summary of Enrique's biography, but uh, based on what you'll find in Navarrete, Okay, uh, it's it mentions that Ma while Magellan was in the in the Indies, at the service of the King of Portugal, he captured a slave um, who may have been purchased. Okay, uh, given and given the name Enrique, he was taught uh, the Spanish language, which he learned to speak fluently. And in 1518, he was presented to a Spanish council together with a female Sumatran slave, where they served as evidence to convince the King of Spain to fund the expedition. Enrique served his master as the interpreter of the Indies um, since the Malay language was spoken from Malacca to the Philippines. And Enrique managed to communicate with locals who spoke Malay and through interpreters, such as the, um, the Moorish interpreter from Siam who was in Cebu when, the, when uh, Magellan and his uh, crew members arrived. Now, Enrique, participated in the formation of alliances and uh, the conversion of the natives, and later fought by Magellan's side during the Battle of Mactan on April 27, 1521, okay, um, where Magellan was killed. Um, Enrique did not perish, but he was injured. And for the next few days, okay, he was on the ship together with the other uh, Spaniards and uh, Europeans, uh, but he refused to serve as interpreter between them and the natives. And for which reason, Duarte Barbosa, okay, uh, the, the person I mentioned earlier, uh, who supposedly called him a dog, told him that his slavery had not ended and that you know, he was compelled to follow their command. Otherwise, he would be whipped. And uh, for this reason, okay, uh, these uh, scholars said uh, he conspired with the Raja of Cebu to kill the remaining Spaniards. And Enrique was last seen at the banquet of the Raja of Cebu, where 27 men with the three captains were ambushed and massacred. So this event forced the rest of the Spaniard to the Spaniards to leave hastily. And um, his fate okay, is uh, uncertain. Um, no one really knows if uh, the last time he was seen, if he was a traitor, because in some accounts he was killed okay, together with the rest of the um, Europeans, while in other accounts, he was seen okay, along the shores as uh, the Spaniards were fleeing uh, after the ambush. Now, that is, and I'm sorry, I'm looking at the time, um, so I have to rush a bit. But um, that is the story of Enrique as he appears in the historical documents. Now, I, I just want to give a brief background on how Enrique came to be known in the Philippines. Okay, and much of what is known about Enrique today comes from the articles written by Carlos Quirino, Carlos Quirino okay, a Filipino national artist. Now, later I will read to you okay, how Carlos Quirino described Enrique in Who's Who in Philippine History. But uh, first I need to, to correct some misimpressions okay, about uh, the origin of Enrique's idea in the Philippines. So it would be safe to assume that educated Filipinos familiar with uh, the account of Antonio Pigafetta and uh, Maximiliano Transilvanus okay, had encountered Enrique in, in their reading. Uh, Wenceslao Retana okay, had written something about Enrique. But, uh, well, for me, uh, a significant um, publication was one by T.H. Pardo de Tavera for the celebration of the fourth centenary of the discovery of the Philippines by Ferdinand Magellan. Okay, so this was in 1921, 100 years ago. 
a commission for the celebration of the fourth centenary was uh, created by Governor General Francis Burton Harrison, and the president of the commission was T.H. Pardo de Tavera. But what I want to point out is that in his um, con conclusion, okay, in, he wrote a narrative, but in his concluding statements, he would state the following. So there is no doubt that the first two men who went around the world finishing their circumnavigation trip in Cebu, it was the Portuguese Hernando de Magallanes and the Malaysian Enrique de Malacca. So this so far is the earliest account I've seen where Enrique was recognized as a circumnavigator of the world, but not necessarily the lone circumnavigator. He was presented as having circumnavigator, sorry, as having circumnavigated the world side by side with, uh, with uh, Magellan. So, but it's interesting that uh, he calls him a Malaysian, but of course, this was prior to the creation of Malaysia as a, as a state. This is 1921, okay? Um, he calls him as ca coming from Malacca, but in his narrative, he also states that Enrique was a native of the Molucas. So uh, anyway, that was the first time that the idea that Enrique was a, circumnavigate, a circumnavigator of the world was circulated, the year 1921. In March 1930, okay, um, Percy Hill published in Philippine magazine a fictitious okay, account. It's more of a love story, the story of Rapu Rapu and Maid Pinili, the ta the time, a ta sorry, a tale of the time of Magellan. And Percy Hill was a prominent American writer. He, he was a member of the American Chamber of Commerce. Uh, he, he was a journalist, okay? Um, and uh, yeah, so aside from reporting on factual events, uh, he was also apparently a literary person. And he wrote this tale where he describes Enrique as a Cebuano interpreter. This is 1930, March 1930, okay? He makes the claim that Enrique was a Cebuano interpreter. But then again, like I said, he never claimed that his account was historically accurate. Okay? It was always clear that this is a work of fiction. Now, in 1940, a Dutch scholar by the name of um, Hendrik Willem van Loon okay, published a book, uh, the title of which is The Story of the Pacific. Van Loon was a, you know, he was a prominent scholar. Um, in fact, he was even awarded the Newberry, uh, no, he, sorry, he was even knighted by the Queen of the Netherlands in 1942. And um, he, he was, uh, he, he studied at Harvard, okay, and then Cornell, okay, and, and the bottom line is he has a very impressive um, background. And in this book, this, uh, the story of the Pacific, he states the following. Somewhere, Magellan had actually picked up a native boy from one of these islands who after many wanderings throughout the Indies had finally found his way to Europe on a Portuguese ship. This young man was more than willing to join new expedition, for it gave him a chance to return to his native land. We're not quite sure what sort of a native he was, but it is usually accepted that he was a Filipino. And in that case, the honor of having been the first to from navigate Filipino and not to one of the survivors of Magellan's expedition, who did not accomplish this feat until several years later. So it was uh, this author, okay, Van Loon, Hendrik Willem Van Loon, who actually first claimed uh, with uh, some, you know, historical uh, authenticity that Enrique was a Filipino. Now, not long after, the head the, or the director of the Philippine National Library, 
Eulogio B. Rodriguez, okay, not to be mistaken for Eulogio Amang Rodriguez, uh, the different persons, but uh, Eulogio B. Rodriguez published in the first volume, volume number one, volume one, number one of the Journal of History. This is the official journal of the what's, what's today the Philippine National Historical Society. Okay, so in that very first journal of the Philippine National Historical Society, he published an article called, Was the First Circumnavigator of the Globe a Filipino? And, um, well, basically, Eulogio Rodriguez um, refers to Van Loon as his source. Okay. Um, excuse me for a moment. So he refers to um, Van Loon as his source. And then he even writes to Van Loon to inquire about his, uh, you know, where he got the information. And Van Loon basically points to a document that had been lost during the war. So he just couldn't find it anymore. But nonetheless, Eulogio Rodriguez uh, would um, ride on this idea that the first person to circumnavigate, circumnavigate the world may have been a Filipino. In 1943, this idea was popularized when a certain Manuel Buenafe, okay, uh, a journalist, published an article in the Sunday Tribune. That was November 21, 1943. And the title of the article was, The First Circumnavigator of the Globe Was a Filipino, without the question mark. Okay, But nonetheless, um, well, he basically refers to um, uh, Rodriguez, Okay, Van Loon and, and the other details mentioned by Rodriguez. But this was wartime. And uh, I don't really, I haven't found any information on how popular the idea was okay, uh, among Filipinos. But, uh, well, to cut the long story short, the idea of Enrique as a Filipino would, uh, again, okay, uh, there would be a resurgence of the idea when Carlos Quirino delivered a speech at the University of the Philippines okay, about uh, Italians in the Philippines. And Carlos Quirino, well, would indicate his sources in his lecture. Um, he would mention Rodriguez. Okay? He would mention Zweig as his source. But without referring to Van Loon, okay, he would also share his, um, you know, his hunch that Enrique was a Filipino. His ideas would develop. Okay, they would be. Uh, it would be published in 1989 in a Panorama magazine article, Sunday Panorama. Uh, in 1991, in the um, in uh, the Philippine Free Press. Okay, there would be another article. But um, the final form of his narrative on Enrique would appear in Who's Who in Philippine History. Okay, which was published in 1995. And uh, well, I know I'm a bit over time, but uh, let me just read to you um, how Carlos Quirino now described Enrique. His early life is unknown, but he was said to be fishing off the coast of Cebu when he was captured by pirates and brought to the slave trade center of Malacca, the Portuguese colony of what is now Malaysia. Ferdinand Magellan purchased him. So what you'll notice here is that he tried to reconcile the inconsistency in the record, or in the records rather. For in some records, okay, like the bill, it stated that Enrique was captured. Quirino was aware of that. Okay, it, it is seen in his articles. But in other sources, it is mentioned um, that Enrique was purchased. So what, what he did was for Enrique to have been captured by pirates, then it so he was purchased. Now, Magellan purchased him because he came from an unheard of place, named him Enrique, then took him along to India, Africa, and Lisbon, Portugal. Before they left Spain on their voyage to the east, Magellan freed him as a slave, so showing his awareness of the will. They traveled to Guam, then to Cebu, where Enrique witnessed the killing of his master by the Mactan chieftain, Lapu-Lapu, and decided he would not return to Spain as a slave. The new commander, Barbosa, ordered him to ask 
uh, Raja Humabon for jewels presented to the Spanish king. But instead, he set the Spaniards up for a lunch with the local leader at which they were slain. He proved useful for his knowledge of Spain and the Port and Portuguese. Now, he must have married, raised a family, and passed away in his 70s just before Legaspi arrived. So what you'll notice is that certain details were added that could not be found in any of the historical records, such as that he was fishing off the coast of Cebu, that he was captured by pirates, okay, that he would uh, stay behind and survive the supposed massacre. Uh, well, he would, so, sorry, he was supposed to survive okay, the massacre and um, he, that he proved useful to Humabon, um, raised a family, and died in his 70s. So that's the problem. Um, at this point, uh, the line between history and imagination okay, was already skewed. And for this reason, um, well, some scholars have, uh, have noticed um, some problems, okay, uh, particularly with the last uh, narrative of Carlos Quirino on the life of Enrique. So anyway, uh, just to conclude my, uh, uh, what's really um, intriguing is why Filipinos feel the need to claim Enrique as one of our own. So the Malaysians, they have a historical source, okay? They have a, a historical source to, to prove it. The, the Indonesians, okay, can also point to the historical sources. But in our case, okay, aside from the fact that he was able to communicate with, with some natives and not even all, remember that in Cebu, he wasn't even speaking with the, with the, with the Raja. In Cebuano, he had to uh, speak through an interpreter of the, of the Raja who was a Moorish interpreter. So Enrique never spoke Cebuano. Okay, um, but why is there a need for us to claim Enrique? Why would we want him to be a Filipino? Okay, is it because of the idea of um, the possibility, you know, just the idea of the possibility that he was the first to circumnavigate the world? As a people, do we have a need for recognition? Okay, um, well, I said earlier that I'll also mention some fictional works on Enrique. So I'll just do that very quickly. Uh, there's Efshanil Jose's Viajero. There's uh, Reni Rojas and Mark Singer's The First Around the Globe, The Story of Enrique, which is a children's book. There's Carla Pazis's uh, Enrique El Negro. Of course, there's also Kidlat Tahimik's uh, Balik Baya No. 1. Okay, that's the most recent title of his memoirs of overdevelopment, his magnum opus. But um, you know what, what you'll sense in these works is not only the idea of a diaspora, okay, Filipinos' involvement in diaspora, but also a need for some kind of recognition. So sometimes I wonder if this is a legacy of the Ilustrados, okay, who in their attempt to prove their equality with the Spaniards, uh, you know, exerted a lot of effort to show our, you know, being able to do whatever they could do and being able to accomplish whatever they could accomplish. Okay, but, so, but such a thing is, uh, of course, something to be discussed. And it's very interesting to compare the, uh, the situation in the Philippines with regard to Enrique with the situation described earlier by Rommel in Indonesia and in Malaysia. So thank you very much. So if you have any questions, please feel free to um, type them in the chat box or the Q&A box. Or how about you, Ramel? Um, so we're, we're uh, looking at the same thing, okay, from different vantage points. Uh, what do you sense is the reason for the way Enrique is remembered? Okay, so it reflects um, the needs. In the case of Malaysia, 
In the case of uh, the claim to Maluku, it's primarily the, the, that kind of, in the case of Indonesia, it's a mix of regional or ethnic and national pride. Because people who are pushing uh, a most ardent supporter of the idea that he came from Maluku were from Maluku. Mm -hmm. So even the governor is yeah, being read well read in the, the schools. And um, one thing that fascinates me in the case of Indonesia is uh, why, wh why the claim because if they if they claim Enrique based on based on the Pigapetas account that he came from Sumatra, it would have been so much easier for them historically speaking. So, and and even the novelist who wrote the novel Panglimaawang, he 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 stated there that Panglimaawang was originally from Sumatra. So mm -hmm. on that base alone, it's so much easier. So uh, why am I'm I'm wondering why do they have to to stake a claim that he's from Maluku, um, but but uh, that's one thing that I'm still trying to figure out. So it, there is this kind of need because the Malukans they are known in Indonesian history as uh, collaborators of the Dutch. So they they're they're. Um, so-called nationalist credentials have been tarnished by their long, long-standing association with the, with the Dutch, and they even had this kind of rebellion. So, so that kind of thing. Now, now that w w once they heard that they that the first circumnavigator of the world was from Malukas, from Maluku, they were very elated by the idea because for the first time there is something very positive that comes out from their, from their own region. So because they. The Mulukans are have they, they suffered a lot of uh, negative stereotypes within Indonesia itself, so, so those kind of very negative stereotypes. So yeah, this is something very positive, and uh, yeah, that will make them really very um, full of pride in this kind of play. In the case of Malaysia, it's quite obvious about the new independent state they needed. Yeah, even up to now, Malaysians Malaysian nationalism is is really like that. So. Anything that will add the uh, luster and all this kind of fame to Malay race, they really embrace it very, very ardently. So that's the reason why I think it's going to be really, there's going to be in the next couple of years when Indonesian claim will increase. So the reaction from Malaysia will be, will also be very strong. So that kind of clash is likely to happen because they have been, they've already taken for granted the idea that uh, Enrique Enrique de Malaga is panglima awang and yeah cannot be it mm. cannot be thought otherwise. It's interesting how um, well in the historical records, it's clear that Enrique was met by or he may have been met okay by Magellan in Malacca, but given his moniker, it's clear that he is associated with Malacca. And we also know that he was last sighted and possibly, very likely, he died in the Philippines in 1521. Therefore, uh, the idea of Enrique being the first circumnavigator of the world is challenged because he never made the complete you know, return home from Cebu back to Malacca. But uh, given the location of the Molucas, okay, um, if the Molucas was indeed the uh, place of origin of Enrique, and then that by itself would complete the circumnavigation, okay, thus uh, ending uh, any claims that he didn't really complete it. Um, see Rodriguez, okay, in his um, art, in his um, uh, study, thought of it in a different manner. Instead of thinking of the circumnavigation as a complete round point to point, okay, uh, by his mere return to Southeast Asia, by his arriving home, he had already circumnavigated. So it's sort of like coming home by leaving through the front door and then you know going back in through the back door. Uh, you're still at home, and that's how somehow Rodriguez uh, gave um, you know credence to the idea of him having circumnavigated the world. Um, any thoughts on that? Uh, actually, the 
um, what seems to be the most uh, scholarly book on Enrique Malaca in Malaysia um, that was published by the museum, Malaca Museum, mm -hmm. also claims, because there are a lot of books on Enrique and a lot are not really very, yeah, this is the most rigorously uh, uh, researched, so written by good historians and also linguists. Um, they also claim that it's enough um, that uh, Enrique was in Cebu. He didn't have to return to, to Tanah Malayu in order for him to circumnavigate the world because it, what matters is it's the Malay world. So that's, that's the way how they, yeah. they did that. So that kind of idea. And the, Malu the Malukans, or the, those who claim for Indonesia, yeah, as you said, when, once he reached Cebu, since Cebu is east, eastern or farther eastern part of uh, uh, Malukas, then he already had done the circumnavigation. He didn't have to come back to yeah. Maluku for, for that. So that kind of... You, you actually said it earlier in another event. Okay, I heard you say it. Okay, that uh, you know, by, by the mere fact of uh, reaching Cebu, he had already completed the circumnavigation because the Moluccas is south of yeah. Cebu, uh, which makes it the most interesting okay, possibility. Um, well, uh, there's there are some questions in the chat box. So the okay. first one I think is related to what you said earlier. Uh, so it says a very insightful and interesting discussion about the, the historical figure. I would like to ask if Enrique's story was used as a way for nationalism after many years of colonialism. Mm. Yeah. I think for Panglima Awang, this applies. That's right, indeed. Yeah, it's a it's a weapon, nationalist weapon. It's very clear in the way how how the novel was uh, written, characterizations. So the the emphasis. The storyline, so you can see there the the very strong nationalist uh, sentiment by the author. Um, one thing that struck me about the uh, Pasi's uh, novel novelet, I was surprised by that. In, in this this very interesting novel because it was the idea. I was thinking of it's going to be much more nationalistic. But in a different way, it was. It is nationalist. But uh, it was more on a critique. Have you read that, that novel? I, I'm fascinated by how it criticizes um, the church, religion, for example. And how supposedly Enrique did not really convert to Christianity. He was, mm -hmm. he was faithful to the animism, to the indigenous religion. So I'm fascinated by that, uh, by the take on Enrique. You mentioned another um, short story or children's book. Yeah. yeah. I yeah I would be very interested to see that. It's it's a. Uh, is it also here. very? It's also nationalistic. Well, it's a uh, it's neutral, but it's neutral. it 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 does wish that Enrique was a Filipino. It's stated by the authors that um, it it sounds like a good Disney movie. Okay. okay. And uh, while it is a children's book, it's a good story, actually. I mean, if you just want to have an idea of the events in which Enrique was involved, it's, a, it's a very reliable. Okay. But then uh, they rely on um, um, Carlos Quirinos's interpretations. So there were certain details that are more fictitious than historical. But it's a, it's a children's book, and it doesn't claim to be a work of history. Okay. Now, the okay. question also reminds me of uh, a newspaper article written in Malaysia by Professor Ahmad Murad Merikan, where he basically describes Enrique's story in Panglima Awang as the story of Malaysia. So he sees a parallelism. So people relate to Enrique okay, because they see the unfolding of their nation. Uh, there's another question in the chat box. Uh, we Filipinos are not claiming Enrique as a Filipino. Do we have enough historical accounts to prove it? What are the positive impacts to our country in any case that it would be proven that he is indeed a Filipino? So would you like to 
answer or shall I? Yeah, you do, please. Okay. Yeah. Well, the bottom line is that um, the historical records show that he wasn't a Filipino. So any other discussion is merely speculative. Okay. Now, it doesn't mean that we cannot adopt Enrique as a hero or a symbol. For um, while we are Filipinos, perhaps our next level of association would be our association with maritime Southeast Asia, okay, where we share, you know, similar uh, a common ethnicity, similar culture, even the way we look, okay, uh, is, is very much, uh, very much alike. So if we look at Enrique, not necessarily as a hero of a particular country, but rather a hero of a region, then he can still serve our purpose. Um, of course, Enrique, uh, some may think of him in an earlier conference, I said that Enrique lacked agency. He basically just followed his master and didn't really decide on what to do. So whatever role he played cannot really be given too much credit. But um, after reading more, Okay, I've come to realize how dependent uh, the Armada de Maluku had become on Enrique, that uh, when he was left in Cebu, either dead or alive, um, you know, they were basically sailing aimlessly and they would encounter other natives in Praus, but they couldn't communicate. They handicapped okay, when they lost Enrique and, and thus showing uh, the, the, the true role Enrique played um, well, for the expedition. But then again, he was on the other side. He was on the side of, and uh, so, but yeah, but, but that's uh, just another matter to consider. We have a comment. Uh, would you like to say anything before I read the comment from Dr. Claudualdo del Mundo? Yeah, so probably it's also good to think about why in the first place we, we need to think Enrique as our own. So what is it in us that drives us to have that kind of claim, if ever we do this kind of claim? So um, yeah, in, in the case of Indonesian Malaysia, and they will definitely be, as likely they will be fighting over Enrique for the next several years to come. Yeah, it reflects on their own uh, anxiety about something. So there, that, that, there's that kind of gap or um, need that will be might be filled mm -hmm. by claiming Enrique as their own. Um, in, in our case, in, in, in the Philippines, um, my impression, I find the, I find the, uh, how do you call it, the consumption or the appropriation of Enrique uh, much more varied much more varied and uh, it re also reflects certain of our own um, anxieties for example thinking of enrique as uh, the earliest uh, ofw okay? mm -hmm. so those those who, who wrote something like that and it's fascinating to see how a particular historical figure assumes particular characteristics that re that is reflective of our own um, anxieties and needs at the moment Okay, so that's the reason why uh, in understanding Enrique, it would be quite useful to really look into him from the memory standpoint and the myth of history kind of uh, standpoint, because it allows, us, uh, it allows us to understand what drives people to consume a particular historical idea or historical figure in a particular, in a certain way, rather, um, rather than uh, rather than stopping on uh, whether it is accurate or not, um, sometimes it is really useful to look into why why they are thinking that it is true, that kind of idea. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And I think it applies too to other characters in history in the region. Yes. Um, so uh, we're running out of time, but please let me read uh, the comment, a uh, question by uh, Dr. Claudoado del Mundo. Two films that include Enrique as a character are Kid Latahimik's film and the movie Lapu-Lapu, produced by LVN in the 1950s. 
In both instances, Enrique is not exactly represented as heroic, unlike the image that you use in your title card. In the LVN film, Enrique is played by Oscar Obligacion, a comedian. Any thoughts about this Pinoy representation of Enrique? That's very interesting. Mm. Yeah, it would be good really to, I, I, I would be happy to, I would be really interested to view the films or any other popular culture, popular media that depicts Enrique in one way or another. Because that would be a pass. In, in Malaysia, for example, it's quite predictable that Enrique would be like this, like that. So even one thing I noticed in the very, very, um, <clears throat> that very scholarly work I took a look at, despite, despite their knowledge that they're really very limited uh, sources about Enrique, they still had to, they cannot do but conform to the um, narrative art that has already been set in place by the, the novel. So they are following largely the novel, Panglimaawang uh, as the novel, as the main, main template. Despite the fact that they have all the reasons to call out some problems with that kind of template. But I, I can understand why they would be like that. And again, it goes back to you know, the, the context in Malaysia. Personally, I haven't seen uh, the 1950s Lapu Lapu movie, nor um, uh, Kidlat Tahimik's um, uh, Balik Bayan number one. Okay, but I have read things about uh, Kidlat Tahimik's Magnum Opus. But uh, it's a very interesting insight from uh, Dr. Del Mundo. What immediately comes to mind is that, well, first, he was branded as a slave. And um, perhaps in the 1950s, uh, the portrayal of slaves were always, you know, less than heroic, unless there is a redeeming, uh, redeeming event okay, at a certain point. And the other is that, well, he was working with the Spaniards. And since, uh, of course, uh, nationalism in the, from the 50s onwards may have driven people to view him as more of um, you know, a traitor than an ally. Uh, I mean, such could be, okay, so again, I'm just speaking from the top of my head, but such could be uh, a possible explanation on the, the, on the lowly depiction of uh, Enrique de Malaca. Okay, so I, I hope we were able to address Dr. Del Mundo's uh, concerns. Okay, uh, if Dr. Del Mundo, would you, if, you'd, if you'd like to say something, please uh, just raise your hand and I can allow you to speak. Is there a way we can have an access to that kind of film by the LBN, the 1950s? That, that I am, yeah, that's that one I am. Or any actually any any movie or any, whatever kind of uh, popular media that depicts Enrique, I would be very interested to see. So if there's any way by which uh, we can access that, that would yeah. be useful as well. I've never even tried looking. So, uh, but it's possible. Yeah, that's uh, that's something interesting to yeah. do. Uh, that's, let's see if uh, yeah. there's a way to see these movies. So well, it's a. Uh, one minute till six, and uh, we're scheduled for only an hour and a half. So, Rommel, thank you very much for joining this My webinar. Pleasure. Okay, My it's pleasure. been a, it, a, an enjoyable discussion. Uh, I learned a lot from you as usual. Same here. I'm I'm going to ask you a lot of questions about what you said about the earlier. I'm fascinated by those things. Yeah. So I'm going. Well, let's discuss further on that. Yeah. Offline. Yeah. Yeah. I'll be glad to. Okay, so to our guests, thank you very much for joining us this afternoon. Again, this webinar was brought to you by the Southeast Asia Research Center and Hub and the Department of History of De La Salle University. So it's been a pleasure. Um, so signing off on behalf of uh, Dr. Romel A. Kuraming, okay, and uh, myself, Fernando A. Santiago Jr., uh, have a pleasant evening. Thank you Goodbye. very much, everyone. Thank you. Thank you.